Hey there and welcome back to NBA 2K17. My name is Pete and today we complete the first year of NBA 2K17's MyGM or if you want to, my league mode, it works just as well, with the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, for those of you who are new to the series, this aims to be less of a guide and uh, more of an assortment of ideas. A few tips and tricks on how to get started with the Sixers in case you're not overly familiar with the roster. The main focus of this series is realism, at least as far as 2K allows for it, so we won't spend 15 minutes building a super team and turning the Sixers from a lottery team into a contender. That's not to say that isn't possible, it's just not the goal of this series. Now about the Sixers themselves, and they are likely a prime target for everyone who's looking to rebuild a franchise in 2K17. With a ton of draft picks and some promising young players, the team is definitely attractive as a longer term project. However, and I think this is important to mention, success won't just come easy and turning Philadelphia into a contender will quite literally be a process. You won't start that process at the very beginning, so there's that, but you're also far from done when taking over the team, so keep that in mind. Still, the Sixers are in a somewhat interesting situation, a situation that we are now going to have a closer look at. Let's start with the roster and let's start at the top with your starting point guard. This is already the first position where you're faced with a tough choice as you can either start TJ McConnell or Jared Bayless. Both have the exact same rating, McConnell is a bit younger and the better playmaker, while Bayless is quicker on his feet and also the much better shooter. No matter who you pick though, the other one will come off the bench, making 30-year-old Sergio Rodriguez a third string option at best. The other guard spot creates a very similar problem, Timothy Luawu, Gerald Henderson and Nick Stauskas are all very close to each other rating-wise, so none of them really sticks out as the clear-cut starter. A bit simplified maybe, Luawu's skill set is more on the athletic side, with high layup ratings and good defense, Henderson is a jack-of-all-trades kind of player, he can shoot, is a passable defender and also pretty athletic, while Stauskas is more or less a pure shooter. From those three, pick your starter depending on your needs, but keep in mind that all three of them can also rotate over to the small forward spot if you desperately want to give them playing time. That small forward spot is where rookie Ben Simmons reigns, although in real life he's currently still injured. You can therefore choose to sit him out for the first year and start Covington, otherwise Simmons is the obvious choice as the starter with Covington as the backup. By the way, even with a 4 point rating decrease if switched to shooting guard, Covington would still be starting caliber material at that position, Justin Anderson on the other hand will only see very limited minutes, if at all. The more we move down low, the stronger the Sixers get and it shows at the power forward. 22 year old Dario Saric is an excellent stretch for and to be honest his only downside is that he's actually better suited for the small forward, at least rating wise. However, I'd stick with him as the starting power forward and use Richon Holmes as his backup. Sean Long is then the odd man out and with a 69 overall rating, he should probably not get playing time. At the center, Joel Embiid starts as the best player on the Sixers. He is incredibly talented both offensively and defensively, the only concern are his injuries, so you should maybe not push him too hard. That means a good backup is required here and you could choose between either Splitter or Okafor. In short, Splitter gives you defense, Okafor offense, playing both will probably not work, so pick the one you think fits your rotation best. With Splitter and Rodriguez, the two oldest players on the Sixes are expiring and freeing up a nice amount of cap space. Both of them are not desperately needed in your rotation, so you can safely let them walk if you want to. Sean Long is, and not just barely, the worst player on the team and once again you're not really depending on him. All in all, your expiring contracts are nothing to worry about. Your team options, however, that's what you're more or less forced to spend a few minutes on, since you have a lot of them. In total, 8 players have an option coming up and while most of them are so cheap they're almost no-brainers, the 9 million dollar option for Henderson, for example, is very much debatable. If you have now already decided that one of those guys with an option will definitely not be back for another season, then you can maybe also plan your current rotation a bit around that. When it comes to cap space, there is really not much to say in Philadelphia. Simply put, money is not an issue at the moment. With 30 million dollars available now and a potential 76 million dollars next season, the Sixers could pretty much sign whoever they desire. Still, it can't hurt to look a few more years into the future, where eventually you'll have to pay players like Embiid or Simmons big time salaries. 
With potentially three first-round picks in the 2017 draft, the Sixers could bring in a whole squadron of young talent. Be advised though that both the Lakers and Mavericks picks are protected and both protections are somewhat likely to actually come into play, leaving the Sixers with only their own pick. Still, that would only delay the inevitable as both picks will have to fall to Philly at some point. Now, I won't bother with the plethora of second rounders you have, but keep an eye on 2019 where you once again have two first rounders. And after the departure of DeMarcus Cousins from Sacramento, that Kings pick might be very attractive. Now, I hope this gave you somewhat of a nice overview regarding the Sixers' current situation. Um, up next, I'd like to point out three key questions or three key problems, if you will, that you will likely also encounter in your first year with the team. And the first one of those will be the role of Jaleel Okafor, more specifically, what exactly his role is going to be. Right now, Okafor will probably come off the bench at center, either ahead or behind Splitter in the rotation. Once Splitter expires, he will have that spot for his own, and that might just be the problem. A big man duo of Holmes and Okafor off the bench, um, that is pretty capable offensively, but severely lacks defense. Therefore, it might actually be an interesting idea to move Okafor to the power forward, where he could get a small rating boost and put a more defensive-oriented center next to him. That would, however, leave Holmes somewhat unoccupied, and you would also need to acquire such a center first, since Splitter is likely not the long-term solution here. Question number two, when do you start attacking the market? With a ton of cap space, you have, at least in theory, the ability to sign pretty much any free agent you desire. However, doing so too early or going after the wrong guy could actually hurt you in the long run. Your team is incredibly young and still very much developing, so adding what I'd like to call win-now players too early could cause problems. On the other hand though, you will have to flip the switch from rebuilding to winning at some point. The third and last question, what is your trade strategy going to be? I think it is safe to say that the Sixers currently have no glaring hole in both their starting lineup and on their bench. Additionally, they do not really lack young talent either, so what exactly are you going to ask for in trades? There is no need to increase your cap space, you already have a ton of picks and you don't want aging stars, at least not yet. So as redundant as it might sound, your best bet right now might actually be to acquire even more young guys and maybe also even more draft picks. Your entire core is between 20 and 25 years young, and if you want your entire team to hit their prime at about the same time, then adding players who are in that same age range makes a lot of sense. And due to that rather large amount of young talented players, there are a few guys who I would personally not trade in Philadelphia. On top of that list are definitely Embiid and Simmons, but also Covington, Sarge and Holmes are only going to get better and could very well end up with ratings in the low to mid 80s. Coincidentally, all of these five guys are frontcourt players, showing you where the strengths and also where the weaknesses of the Sixers currently are. Now, with a bit more light on the Sixers situation and also on the challenges they might face along the way, I think it's time for the three moves. So let's get started with move number one, we're going to trade Gerald Henderson. The shooting guard spot is currently occupied by three players all battling for minutes. Giving regular playing time to all three will be very hard, especially since switching to the small forward is not an option with the much better Simmons and Covington there. Age-wise, Henderson is a few years ahead of your core and will likely be out of his prime once the team becomes truly competitive. He's also on an expiring deal worth quite a bit of money and although you don't need to cut salaries, a trade will definitely get you more here in return than simply declining his player option and letting him walk. I think planning ahead for the future a bit and adding a defensive-minded center makes sense, since Splitter will probably not be back with the team after the season. Above all though, age is important here. You definitely want to grab someone who is a few years younger than Henderson, even if you downgrade slightly rating-wise. The first option for a trade, which involves two players each, would be this trade of Henderson, Long and a second rounder for Bismack Biambo and the expiring CJ Watson from Orlando. The centerpiece of this trade would of course be Biombo, and in this trade the Magic would get rid of one of their worst contracts. A contract, on the other hand, that you can absorb without much issue. Defensively, Biombo is absolutely great and he would be a nice piece to anchor your defense down low. He does come at a price, that's true, but money should not be an issue for roughly the next three seasons. Another two-player trade would be Henderson and Long for Alex Lan and Ronnie Price from Phoenix. Len is also a very solid defender, maybe not on the level of Biombo, but he is a bit more versatile and one year younger. 
His contract is expiring, but as far as I know, he will become a restricted free agent, giving you full control over his future with the team, at least for one more season. I actually went with Biombo. I think it's a bit more realistic for the Magic to move him than it is for the Suns to move Len, although in the end I would argue both trades are definitely possible. By the way, sometimes this trade also works with only Henderson and the second rounder for Biombo straight up. Biombo now slides into the rotation at center and creates a bit of a mess there with now four centers. However, that is a problem that we are going to solve rather quickly in move number two, and that is switching Jaleel Okafor to power forward. Now, normally I just mention position changes as we go, but in this case I think it deserves an entirely separate move, as a few adjustments to your rotation come along with it. First of all, making Jaleel Okafor a power forward will increase his rating by one or two points, depending on your team chemistry, and it will open the backup center for Biombo. Thiago Spiller can be safely moved to the reserves, as he will be gone after the season anyway. The problem at center is now somewhat solved, but instead we now have three viable options at the power forward, which is probably one too many. Nonetheless, we want to assign playing time to all three of them, preferably 20 minutes for both Holmes and Okafor, and 25 to 30 minutes to Saric. And we are doing that with Saric's ability to play the small forward in mind. So yes, he will start at the power forward, but actually play a lot of his minutes at the small forward behind Simmons. And here is where things trickle down even further and Robert Covington comes into play. You might remember that I mentioned earlier that if you switch him to shooting guard, he could very well still make the case for starter there. While we are going to stick with Luwabo for that role, Covington can now steal the spot of the rather one-dimensional Nick Stauskas. And Stauskas will also be the only one who's unhappy with that, since we just traded away Henderson. And just like that, a trade that brought in a defensive center has affected pretty much our entire rotation. Okafor and Saric definitely profit here, since both of them are better suited for the power forward and small forward positions respectively, while Covington's versatility is enough to keep him serviceable even as a shooting guard. Whether or not you actually change his position to shooting guard is up to you, he can play the position even if he stays a small forward. One last thing, for all of this to work just the way you want to, I highly recommend using the rotation timeline feature in the game plan menu. Here you can meticulously manage who plays where for every single minute of the game, and this will certainly help making all those changes work. In this scenario, Splitter, Stauskas and Anderson are not part of your rotation, simply because you can afford it. They won't like it though, so maybe it makes sense to occasionally give them a few minutes. We can, however, turn the expiring contract of Splitter into something a bit more valuable without giving him playing time, and we're doing that now in our last move. Move number 3, trade either Thiago Splitter or Sergio Rodriguez for a young point guard. Both Splitter and Rodriguez occupy the end of the bench right now, and both are on expiring deals, and while we do not desperately need something in return, it sure would be nice. And what we're looking for is a young point guard, and when I say young I mean barely in his 20s. With McConnell likely starting and Bayless as the backup and on the contract for the next three seasons, this young point guard has exactly those three years to develop into a serviceable backup player with a rating around 75. His current rating can be substantially lower though, this is by all means an investment into the future. The tricky bit will be to acquire such a player in exchange for Splitter or Rodriguez, since both of their contracts surpass the average salary for a player in his young 20s by quite a lot. Therefore, teams with a bit of cap space become the focus for this move. One of those teams, the Brooklyn Nets to be exact, are home to a young point guard named Isaiah Whitehead. For Splitter and one or two second rounders, the Nets should be willing to part ways with the 6-4 point guard. Once again, for Splitter and a few picks, you could acquire Tyrus Jones from Minnesota. Chris Dunn might also be available, and at least with 2K's ratings in mind, both of them make sense. Jones seems like the all-around better choice, since he is younger and already a bit higher rated than Dunn, but Dunn has a few more points in his potential and might, despite his two-year head start, turn out to be the better player. Tyler Ennis from the Lakers is another potential candidate, although I find his potential to be a bit low. I actually decided to go with Chris Dunn here, because he's currently the lowest rated point guard on the Timberwolves roster, and therefore the team should realistically be somewhat willing to give him away for the right package. That package did include the lottery protected first rounder from Dallas, which seems like a high price to pay at first, but considering the rather low quality of talent available outside of the lottery in most 2k drafts, I was more than willing to part ways with it. 
for his first year with the Sixers, Dunn will then only see playing time if either McConnell or Bayless are injured. He should definitely be ahead of Rodriguez in the rotation though, unless you already included Rodriguez in this move. Then hopefully in 2-3 years, Dunn will have reached a high enough rating to play 15-20 to 20 minutes behind McConnell, and who knows, maybe he can even surpass him and become a starter. With those moves made, you should now have a rotation that can still shift slightly here and there, depending on injuries or player happiness. As long as we stick to 2k, it is actually not too unreasonable to expect this team to make the playoffs. In most of my test runs, I was able to secure one of the lower playoff seats rather easily. If you decide to sit Simmons out for the year, your season might of course turn out a bit differently. You now have draft and free agency coming up, and while none of your positions truly scream for help, maybe another guard could be on your target list. You are pretty much free to make your own decisions though, the core of the team should be well in place. If you moved Henderson like I did, then I would recommend accepting all of the team options, since you probably won't find such a nice package of talent for that amount of money again. You should now still have more than 30 million dollars in cap space, enough to maybe bring in your first star. From here on out, I wish you the best of luck, I'm sure you'll push the sixes in the right direction. As always, leave any questions or suggestions down below in the comments, I've had some great discussions with you guys in the past weeks and I'd love to continue talking about potential moves for all of these teams. If you like this video, I would of course be happy if you could give it a thumbs up and if you want to support the channel, then you can become a subscriber by simply clicking on the small trophy icon on the top right of your screen. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers!